Welcome to Art or Something Like It, a television series about artists of all genres, backgrounds, and media, from music, performance, writing, and poetry, to photography, sculpture, film, and video. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. You're watching Art or Something Like It. 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 Okay, action. Hello there! I'm Elias of Beef Juggernaut Productions from season one. Art is what you make of it. Cut. What's up? My name is Adam Matta. I'm here with my friend Kimba. She's a son conure here at the Staten Island Children's Museum. And we're going to do a little duet for you. So, are you ready, Kimba? Adam Mata is a multimedia artist who works with beatbox, fine art, traditional drawing and sketching and painting, sound, using audio tape and uh, digital effects, and I use video too, I create animation. And I try and merge all these different issues and different media and slap them all together and see what happens. I feel that art in the States in 2006 is sort of at this medium, mediocre point. <laughs> um, not in terms of the quality, but just in terms of the, the way that it's received. And I heard that people spend one second in front of, on the average in front of a piece of art in the Metropolitan Museum. Art that's not um, commercial art and not, not commercial music. I mean, the commercial art and the commercial music almost by definition has to have a minimized soul <laughs> and I feel like people need to be flocking towards the art and music that has as much soul in it as possible. Hello, I'm here with my bike sculpture, Bicycle Wheel and Walkman. It's a combination between Marcel Duchamp's bicycle wheel and Laurie Anderson's piece violin with a tape bow. And I've strung tape around the wheel so that when I play it, it's going to create sound and I can scratch it like a DJ scratches a turntable and I'm going to improvise with my beatboxing at the same time and I hope you enjoy it. So now you've seen me perform with my bicycle wheel. Now I'll take you to a shot of me performing on my bike, creating a painting on the ground. Check it out. My bike drawing performance is uh, kind of like taking action painting and updating it to, to, uh, to modern times with extreme sports and basically what I'm doing is I'm taking my mountain bike, riding through paint and doing tricks on a canvas. So I leave behind uh, a painting on the ground, an abstract painting, kind of like a Jackson Pollock piece or Eve Klein with the uh, naked bodies being smothered in paint and rolling around on canvas. Hey, Happy, it's Adam. Hey, Adam, how you doing? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm peachy. Can't see your face, there you go. Oh, oh thank you, thank you so much. So, uh, why'd you get into beatboxing? Yeah, you know, I just uh, would um, be on my way to school and uh, uh, just started doing beats with my voice. Like, mm -hmm, don't want to go to school today. Mm -hmm. 
but it'll go anyway. You know, you know, I keep on rhyming to myself, beatboxing, and uh, one time I was at, like 12 years old and I was uh, sitting in the back seat with my cousin and I was doing some little, beat, little beatboxing and he was like, where's that music coming from? And I was like, oh, oh, I don't know, I don't know. You know, I always wanted to keep it to myself. But then, um, like about, about five, six years ago, somebody heard it and said, hey, you know, that's really good. And, and I said, well, maybe I should try and do this on the mic in front of other people and take it to the performance level. And so I did, and things have been really going well since then. We are here at WEXP Radio at Staten Island Children's Museum radio station. I'm here to kick a beat with our friend, Happy the Hippo. A friend of mine, Philip Hamilton, sort of recommended that a good career should kind of go like, like that, you know, up, plateau, you know, so I'm kind of trying to keep riding that, but most of the time it's like this, <laughs> but you just got to keep trying to maintain the balance so it slowly, slowly rises. Thank you for watching Art or Something Like It. My name is Adam Matta. If you want to find out more information about my artwork, go to www.adammatta.com. That's A-D-A-M-M-A-T-T-A.com. Thank you and have a great day. Hi, I'm Scott McLeod, our author of Making Comics. When I work, I try to obey four different rules in learning and working. Number one, learn from everyone. Number two, follow no one. Nobody has all the answers, but you've got to look around. You've got to look at everything you can. Number three, watch for patterns. There are connections between works, between ideas. And number four, work like hell. There's no way to do it unless you do it. Thanks for watching Art or Something Like It. I'm Scott McLeod. If you want to learn more, you can go to scottmcleod.com. Hey, I'm Russell Chance, and welcome to my studio. I'm an artist. My style is pop art, and I do acrylic on canvas. Um, art is many things to many people. To me, it's something that you know makes people think. Um, and they don't have to think about some world event. You know, like my paintings are fun, sometimes a little twisted. Um, if it just gets them to laugh a little bit, um, I think that's, that's good for me. Okay, this painting is called, and that's when I jumped over the moon. And it's kind of a take on the hey little diddle, the cat and the fiddle nursery rhyme. And basically, the cow has entered a, a bird bar and is just relaying his version of the story to whoever will listen. This is one of several paintings I did from that uh, nursery rhyme. Um, it was like, you know, the cat, and he's, I think he's at a gator bar. And um, uh, the spoon, she's at a bread fetish bar. And that's kind of what inspired this piece, Thursday night at the bread fetish club. I had kind of run out of types of bars to, uh, to paint, so I kind of went a little crazy and created a, a bread fetish bar. Uh, there's actually a lot more 
on the canvas that's representative of me than you'd think at first. Um, a lot of my paintings um, show parts of my life. Uh, that's actually me and my girlfriend uh, in my bedroom, and I've made a mess looking for a specific t-shirt. So she came in to see what I've done, and she's quite surprised and a little annoyed that I uh, made our bedroom quite a mess. This piece is called Hey Ladies, Check This Out. It's about a guy who's maybe not the coolest guy in the world, maybe doesn't have all the looks or the muscles of people, but he's got this x-ray vision and he's trying to pick up girls by showing different things that he can look through. My influences include uh, Roy Lichtenstein and Andy Warhol. Uh, those two artists that I saw when I was in college, uh, they really inspired me. I liked uh, Lichtenstein's bold colors and dark lines, and I liked uh, the lifestyle that Andy Warhol had with like the factory and um, just mass producing the work and big parties and like living like a rock star. This painting is called Heart Attack and I did it for a show called Love, Art and War and as soon as I heard the, the name of the show uh, this image came into my head of, of hearts coming down and battling um, things that you associate with love such as unicorns and stuffed animals and puppies and chocolate and music and diamond rings. I think everyone wants to be a, a rock star um, but not everyone can. This painting uh, is my most recent. It's, it's called Suspicious Pancake and I got the idea for this. Um, I was walking through Manhattan and I saw a sign that said suspicious package but I misread it so I went along with my bread and baked goods uh, theme and uh, painted what it would look like if there was a sp suspicious pancake uh, waiting for the subway. Okay, So this is the beginning of one of my paintings. Um, it starts off with a sketch which I'll draw at a coffee shop or um, a bar or just anywhere I am. So this is the image that inspired this painting. Just like a rough outline of what's going on and then when I actually get to the canvas I'll start adding other little pieces of the background. Um, like over here I added a stack of paintings that's not here. Um, you know, I added a dresser that wasn't there. His sketchbook isn't there but I added that in. I like to add a lot of little details to make the painting more complete. I think my characters just kind of become what become themselves. I don't sit down and think of like oh, I'm gonna make this really weird character and freak everyone out. I just start drawing and then I kind of just improvise what comes out on the page and just think what would come next. Like I drew this guy and then I was like well I've got these people boxing in front of me so I put a little boxing thing in and I said, well, where is he? And I said, well, he's starting to look like he's got a beret on. So I gave him that, and then I put him in France. And then it just evolves on its own. And I just do it very quickly, so I don't have time to think and second guess myself. And because doing it on you know, quick pencil sketch, it doesn't matter if I don't use it ever again. And it's, you know, it doesn't really hurt me if I have to throw it away. And in a few more hours, this is going to turn into this. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. If you want to find out more about me, visit my website, www.russlachance.com. Bye. I'm Nick Basile, the director of the new documentary American Carney, True Tales from the Circus Sideshow. We're here in Coney Island today, and we're going to be talking a little bit about American Carney and some of my other films here on Art or Something Like It. But first, come on, we'll take a ride on the infamous and famous Wonder Wheel. American Carney 
is a new feature documentary that I directed and produced that is featuring Todd Robbins, who if you watch this show, you'll, uh, you'll see Todd on uh, eating glass, uh, maybe hammering a nail into his nose. And he's um, one of the foremost purveyors of reality at its most amazing. Uh, he's not only a showman and a sideshow performer of the ancient arts of uh, sword swallowing and fire eating, but um, he's also a historian and is pretty much has an encyclopedic knowledge about the history of sideshow. This is it. This is the one you read about, you heard about it. Now you got to see it live right here. It's the sideshow. It's the world's greatest gathering of human curiosities. Everything you see. The so you know, I approached him. I started working then at Monday Night Magic, this off Broadway magic show. Uh, backstage and we started to become friends with many of the magicians and performers there and got to know Todd better and I said to him I know Todd you've been on a lot of shows on the History Channel you've been on Conan O'Brien and Jay Leno all this stuff you know, but has anyone ever done really a documentary on you and he said no I said would you be interested he said okay sure and there's gonna be this uh, you know short little thing maybe uh, uh, show part part of his performance part of his show a few interview pieces but as we got involved in it like anything else he started saying well you know you got to meet um, we have a he knows a, a, a real bearded lady who used to work out at Coney Island uh, Jennifer Miller the woman with a beard also has her own circus it's called Circus of Monkey she really meet her and I met Jennifer and she was a fascinating person and a fascinating performer and got to talk to her and then it just started to grow bigger and bigger and bigger you got to meet uh, James Taylor a guy who um, at the time, along with a guy named Dick Horn, had the American Dime Museum, which is still the American Dime Museum, is still down in Baltimore. But uh, uh, James Taylor also has his own publication called Shocked and Amazed Magazine. So I meet with this guy, and he's and he has so much stuff and more stories to tell. And then you get, eventually you got these guys, Harley Newman, professional lunatic, who lays on a bed of four nine-inch spikes. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually you find yourself two and a half years later with all this material and you're forming it into a story. And you find that Todd is is sort of the, the centerpiece, is sort of the um, narrator, if you will, that's leading you through this world. Uh, and that's, it really became a sort of thing where it was I, on the onset, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna spend three years of my life making a feature movie about the sideshow. It just kind of grew out of the material, it just kind of, kind of got immersed into it. Boy, there's an actor out in Coney Island. I think I recognize him, I think he's worked for me before. But since I don't pay my actors, since none of us have any money, he seems to be hungry and looking for garbage to eat. Come on. You gotta be very quiet. Shh. The reason we're so, we're so quiet is for dramatic effect. I'm going to use the tater fries to lure him. Lure. in Coney Island like eating out of the garbage? Uh, nothing better to do. Yeah, aren't you having a movie that's coming up soon? Yeah, yeah. There you go. You were in my movie. You were great. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. I am in your movie. I think we, he and I together have done more sound design than anyone else uh, that we know in, yes. our, in our circle of friends and people that we work with. We, we bought, I would say, between two to four raw whole chickens, uh, a bunch of peppers, uh, uh, any watermelon, some melons, I'm sure. Uh, dishes. Everything you could you imagine. dishes for Bell and Star. And we beat and mashed, pulpified, and found really cool and unusual ways to manipulate. Manipulate. I just got shit. That material. I also. Don't try 
try this at home because this has caused permanent damage to my left eye and I have unfortunately ripped out both of my eyelids doing this. Thank you for watching Art is Something Like It. If uh, you're interested in seeing more about the documentary American Carney True Tales from the Circus Sideshow, please go to the website for the film at www.americancarney.com. That's a wrap. Greetings from Tromaville. I'm Lloyd Kaufman, president of Troma Entertainment and creator of The Toxic Avenger. And you are watching art or something like it. Howdy there. This is Breadfoot. And we're going to do some picking and some jawing. And we're going to start off with a tune called Polly Love Me I Know. Polly uh, Love Me I Know is a song that I made up about a girl I had a crush on in third grade. Way back in the third grade, we were in this art class, you see. And we were making these things that in the end kind of looked like stuffed potatoes. Now when y'all finish with the stuff that you're making there, you got to put them up on the windowsill for everyone to look at. And I was real keen on getting my potato thing next to Polly's potato thing. Certainly like to think it would have meant a lot to her. I can tell you for sure that it meant a lot to me. All right then, this is Paul Love Me I Know. I guess what a lot of folks want to know is, is, is where you end up getting a name like Breadfoot. Um, well, the thing, thing is, it, it it's, has to do with them sort of stories that, that, that your, your folks are going to tell. Maybe when you, when you, when you take your, your best girl over there to, you know, for the first time, and then for some reason, they, they kind of want to embarrass you. you know? uh, don't know why, but that's what they want to do. And, and the thing is, there was two stories they like to tell about me, and one of them had to do with the fact that uh, when, when I was a, a, a wee little one, that, that um, I, I was able to unroll the roll of to toilet paper through, through the house, you know, the whole thing, without ever breaking it. Um, that, that was the one they liked to tell. And then the other one, of course, has to do with me deciding that, that it would be a funny idea to, to, to make shoes out of loaves of bread. And uh, I hauled them out, and uh, I was wearing things around. And uh, so you do something like that, you know, it kind of sticks with you. What we care to do for you right now is a tune called For My Sake. It's part of a new batch of songs that I'm working up for the next record. Uh, the last two records, they were all instrumental, meaning to say that they didn't have no words on them. And now I, I, I got it somehow, uh, I don't know, be in my bond or bug up my butt or however you want to put it. And I decided I wanted to kind of put some words on some songs. So uh, here's one for you now. <laughs> Sitting in your kitchen. That's when I noticed that. And all the love you had left for me was laying. music go, goes a little ways back. We would have been just getting out of high school and, and, and we, we decided that uh, we wanted to do the senior talent show. Um, in fact, the matter, and this might be curious because the last two records are all instrumental, I, I, I was vocalist and uh, we decided what we wanted to do was some ACDC songs and uh, had a lot of fun with them. That, that's, that would have been my, like, my first introduction to it and, and I guess having said that, you think that uh, was is you know maybe I kind of wanted to be a rock star or something I, I I I don't know, but then after I got more serious about my guitar probably about uh, 10 15 years ago 
you know, more serious about my instrument and, and, and just trying to do more and different things with it, kind of, you know, like tell stories, make it talk and all that. Um, I got away from that because I found that the music that really got me going didn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, all those big rock and roll aspirations. You know, it, uh, it, it kind of took me someplace else. It was late November day and I couldn't get home. Well, uh, beyond songwriting, uh, I get myself into a few other things. I, I do some illustration and some painting. Most often, uh, when I'm illustrating or painting, it's, it's going to be for the purposes of uh, doing like record cover. Like I did the Funhouse records, and uh, I did a pen and ink drawing for that. And the uh, most recent release, the Tea with Leo, I did, I did a, a big old painting for that one there. There was a time when I got to asking myself, self, well, why, why is it that, that, that you make the music? And, 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 and I wasn't sure. I had the occasion when I was in Carolina to catch a fellow that, uh, by the name of Kevin Kenny. He used to play with an outfit called Driving and Crying. <clears throat> and I bought him a whiskey and I, and I asked him why he made music. And he told me that the reason that he made music is because it helped him to figure stuff out. And I thought about that and, and, and uh, you, know, ha you know, looking for a reason to be inspired again to make music myself, I, I, I figured that, that that was really probably the best reason, is, is that it helps you to figure stuff out. It, it helps you to get through things. It helps you to get over things. It helps you to uh, keep moving and, uh, and getting on. All right, well, we sure want to thank you for stopping by and, 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 and having a look-see at Art or something like it. I'm Breadfoot, and if you want to find out more about what i got going on, you can go to breadfoot.com. Check out what's there. Hope you dig it. Thanks again. Art or something like it. Art or something like it. Art or something like it. Was your day? My day sucked because I didn't watch art or something like it. <laughs>